Hello, everyone. Good morning to those of you in Canada and good afternoon to those of you in Europe. Welcome to our second webinar of a series of four webinars by the CETA Market Access Program for EU Businesses, with today's topic being how to find a business partner in Canada. For those of you who request it, uh, we can send you the slides from this presentation after the webinar. And any questions that you may have during the presentation, you can write them via the chat and questions tab on your GoToWebinar platform. They will be answered during the final Q&A session by the expert. We also invite you to complete a short survey once exiting the webinar for your feedback. My name is Mertola Zaltan, um, working at Development Solutions. We are implementing the CETA Market Access Program. Before I introduce you to our presenter today, I want to briefly mention the CETA Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement between the European Union and Canada. For EU businesses, it is mostly eliminated tariffs on 99% of European exports to Canada, and it has made administrative procedures easier with lots of unnecessary red tape being cut. It has brought numerous benefits for easier labor mobility across borders and improved investment environment, standards cooperation, and better intellectual property protection for your business in Canada and much more. Speaking of numbers, between 2017 and 2019, European goods exports to Canada from the European Union rose from 32.2 to 38.3 billion euros per year, with nearly a 19% increase in this new CETA environment. As you can see here on the screen, I would also like you to refer to our previous webinar last year, if you would have the time later on, on how to export to Canada and benefit from CETA, which gave attendees a step-by-step -step guide on the process of exporting to Canada and how to benefit from the new trade agreement. Finally, just a little bit about our program, the CETA Market Access Program. We are completely funded and supported by the European Union. What we do is we assist European businesses and particularly small to medium-sized enterprises to take full advantage of the CETA agreement. We help EU SMEs gain comprehensive sector-specific information about the opportunities that the agreement brings in terms of removing market access barriers. We provide guidance to businesses on how to benefit from CETA while addressing challenges in their business strategies. And finally, we create channels of communications between businesses that would like to export to Canada. And now before we begin, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Ms. Pernille Fisher-Bolter. With over 20 years of experience in international trade, Ms. Bolter is the CEO and founder of Kiss Europe International Trade Routes. She's now based in Halifax, Canada. She started in Denmark, but has now long been based operating in Canada. She frequently advises her international clientele on trade strategy and markets across 90 countries and facilitating trade missions. Ms. Bolter is also involved in multiple organizational engagements, such as being a mentor at the Center of Women in Business and a board member of the Canadian Association of International Development Professionals. With that being said, I now turn the floor to Ms. Bolter for her presentation. Uh, thank you very much to Market Development and Matol, you and all your colleagues, and to uh, the EU for having me on for this seminar. I really appreciate it. Um, good afternoon to the, to the European folks and good morning to the Canadian folks, as, as Matol said. And I am here to tell you what has worked for me, uh, what has worked for a lot of colleagues like yours, um, and like you entering the Canadian marketplace. Our company, Kisarop International, is headquartered in Canada. We have a subsidiary in Europe and in the Arctic as well. So what I will be sharing with you today is the SME way of doing things. So we're going to take you through uh, in a very hands-on and practical way. So the agenda for this uh, webinar is, is listed here, and it is about how you can make contact to potential car, uh, partners in Canada. We're talking a little bit about Canada as we start with. As Matol mentioned, the previous webinars have been very helpful and have hands-on guides. Here, we're going to tell you a little bit about the Canadian culture, because that's going to be important um, if you want to make a connection with people in Canada. 
we're going to talk about different tools uh, that will assist you in connecting with people in Canada. We're going to give you very hands-on tools and all that we talk about is linked throughout the PowerPoint. So you will be able to click on the link and apply your own information as you do research going forward. We will also talk a little bit about the market in Canada, which is unique in its private label market. And we will talk about resources that is available uh, both from the EU and from Canada. We'll touch a little bit on procurement because this is an important way both for goods and service providers uh, to gain access to Canada. And with CETA being the most comprehensive trade agreements ever, uh, procurement is included. We'll talk a little bit about if you uh, go all the way and you want to establish your own uh, company in Canada, give you a couple of links. We'll talk about the intro requirements to Canada, uh, not as they are related to CEPA labor mobility, so your ability to actually come into Canada, but the actual immigration ways. We will then end with a couple of success stories where you may uh, hopefully be able to see yourself um, duplicating some of those steps that European firms have taken to connect in Canada. So starting here uh, and introducing you to Canadian culture. Um, Canadian culture is very political correct. Uh, and the most questions we get on, um, on Canadian culture from European firms is what I have listed in the second column, the ones that say in greetings. French and English. It's all a Canada bilingual. Do I have to speak both languages to get uh, to become successful in Canada, and no, you don't. The official language policy or the official policy of Canadian is bilingual in English and French, and that means that the government of Canada has to communicate in both English and French. And to give you an idea, around 25% um, is the fully French speaking in Canada, the other um, English speaking, and around 20% is fully bilingual. So if you don't have one or the other language, you can get, you can most often get by in one of them. Canadian culture uh, is not far from a lot of the same ways that I acted in Europe. Um, the, the biggest challenge that I probably had uh, getting into Canada and getting successful in business was to understand the colloquial English. And to help you a little bit uh, with that, I'd like to show you a video. It's only one minute. Um, and it is uh, here a fun way to experience a little bit about Canada too. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm not a lumberjack or a fur trader, and I don't live in an igloo or eat blubber or own a dog sled. And I don't know Jimmy, Sally, or Susie from Canada, although I'm certain they're really, really nice. I have a prime minister, not a president. I speak English and French, not American, and I pronounce it about, not a boot. I can proudly sew my country's flag on my backpack. I believe in peacekeeping, not policing, diversity, not assimilation, and that the beaver is a truly proud and noble animal. The tooth is a hat, the Chesterfield is a coach, and it is pronounced said, not seen, said. Canada is the second largest land mass, the first nation of hockey, and the best part of North America. My name is Joe, and I am Canadian. Thank you. Canada, uh, while we are part of North America, we do not uh, think of ourselves, most Canadians do not think of themselves as North Americans, but distinctly Canadians. And that's pretty important to have in mind uh, when you are interacting with Canadians. And Canada is a large country. And I want to share with you some of the things that a lot of people have challenges with when they're trying to get their head around Canada. 10 provinces and three territories. And as I said, uh, two official languages. And if you look at the graph on your right-hand side, we have six time zones in Canada. 
something that is often very hard to grasp. And we have uh, Newfoundland and Labrador standard time, which is just half an hour different uh, than all the other uh, time zones. So this is often creating issues when people are trying to connect on Skype or on, on calls. Um, so remember that half hour, but six time zones across the country. So take that into account when you try to figure out where you want to do business in Canada. Canada has about 38 million people. And to show you the diversity again, Ontario uh, has almost uh, just over 14 million people. And Nunavut um, as a territory has 38,000 people. So big split in where the population is located. Canada's uh, population clock is a slide that we uh, put in here, and it is actually hyperlinked. So if you click on the top uh, Canada's population clock when you get the presentation, you will be able to go in under each province and territory and see what the, what the patterns are of that particular province, what the makeout is of that province, the territory. And you will see that immigration to Canada and immigrants in Canada is hugely uh, affecting consumer ways and business behavior, consumer behavior. And we are putting tools like that in to help you uh, increase your engagement and your success rate in Canada. When we are saying that immigration is important, if you look at the number here, uh, that will give you an idea that Immigrants today make up 65% of Canada's net annual population growth. So chances are that whatever organization that you may be dealing with as a partner has a lot of immigrants in their organizations. We have 40% immigrants in my organization alone. It will filter through in the first part of how to find a partner because about 80% of the inquiries that we get in our firm are being referrals from, from other immigrants or immigrant settlements associations of somebody in a network who's saying, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I know that you had helped some before. Can you help me with a couple of things? So moving into part two, that, um, that picture of immigration in Canada, we put on this, uh, on this graph here, and this is from Statistics Canada. So 350,000 new people in Canada a year, and not that uh, the European Union here will be the biggest influx, but it will still uh, be a lot of the goods and services that you are exporting to other parts of the world that will also be in demand by those people uh, that are new residents of Canada. We, uh, we have seen that immigration is one of the most effective ways, or immigrant networks is one of the most effective ways for you to establish first contact. We have therefore put a resource in here, which is not normally one you would find if you're Googling things. It's not normally one you will find if you go on Canadian resources or great resources like uh, the European Help Desk or any of those. This is a listing of the immigrant settlement associations from uh, in, in uh, Canada, and it's for the each of the provinces and territories. We have had several uh, people who contacted us this way. Our own firm needed a Spanish-speaking trade lawyer. We didn't know any. We didn't know where to start. We called the local immigrant settlement association. They put us in contact with a person. We got the Spanish speaking trade lawyer and our team, and we won a contract to deliver training across the Caribbean. We had a person from Poland uh, who contacted the immigrant settlement as, uh, association, who were then referred to us. That person ended up being a matchmaker, landing a consulting contract uh, for the Soviet School of Business to take a Canadian trade mission to Poland. So this is a good resource. It's not a traditional resource, but it is a closed knitted um, organizations that have an interest in helping people 
um, getting further into Canada. So it's a very good place to start. We have uh, also listed a number of the bilateral chambers in commerce. And for many of you that may be uh, from a chamber that's not listed here, I apologize. We did not put all of them in. We just listed uh, a number of examples. Um, these are bilateral chambers that would have the same sort of entry and network in both, uh, for the first example, the Polish Chamber of Commerce, both in Poland and in Canada. The other part of this here is that a lot of uh, EU member countries have their own trade council, their trade office, so an office established in Canada that is bilateral. Um, and we have put an example in here for the uh, for the Danish trade office in Toronto, very active and seeing a lot of new activity due to CEDA, I believe they would have test to. Um, so each country might have a representation in Canada too. Uh, the Italian Chamber of Commerce did a great um, event uh, recently that I attended, uh, and I heard so many positive things about it afterwards as well. These links are good for you to explore. They're good for you for first contacts, and they may be good for vetting some of the contacts you may already have established or established in the future. So that was a little bit about the immigration part. Uh, and we put it first because, again, this is where we have seen most successes come in through. Now we kind of move on to the little bit more uh, traditional approach, and that is looking online. Um, a lot of people, particularly in manufacturing and consulting, uh, will start here. So they will find a database of or you will find a database of associations. And we have listed three here, while there are many more in the top link. Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters Association, very often used when European firms are looking to find somebody who will manufacture under license in Canada. Uh, the Information Technology Association of Canada, which also has chapters in the provinces and territories. Uh, very often used for uh, partnering within ICT. And then the Canadian Advanced Technology Association, also an advanced manufacturing, um, a great link to potential partners there. Each link will give you um, access to viewing the mandate of the association. A few of them will allow international memberships for limited, um, a limited amount of money, uh, so that might be a good way if you are planning a long-term strategy into Canada to, to looking at membership as an option. We wanted to mention to you uh, a relatively new initiative in Canada called Canada Superclusters because they affect everything that's going on across Canada right now. It is a $950 million initiative from the Government of Canada, uh, and it's mapped by private sector. The aim is to empower Canadian SMEs, empower them to commercialize new products and services, and uh, part of the mandate is to encourage Canadian firms to partner with international firms. So that could be you um, in finding partners and taking trade more international. There are five clusters here. The digital one um, is based, the digital technology supercluster is based in, in BC, but of course you could be on the East Coast and still have a relationship. We have um, the protein cluster, which is much around agri-foods, agriculture, uh, which is based on what we call the prairies in Saskatchewan in Canada. We have the next generation, which is based in Ontario. We have uh, SCALE, which is the artificial intelligence or uh, digital intelligence, as it's more commonly referred to in Quebec. And then we have the Oceans Supercluster in Atlantic Canada. So very keen organizations on finding international partners 
And if you see yourself as a participant today, having specific interest in any of these clusters, I encourage you to contact them. So we move into the uh, clicking online a little bit more here. And as you may know, uh, Canada's largest trading partner today is the U.S. on the export side, but Canada's largest trading partner, not being export, uh, but trading interprovincially, uh, is larger than what we actually sell to the U.S. So it is very likely that your competitor on your product or your service may not be from the EU, may not be from the U.S., they may be Canadian. So here is a directory of Canadian companies that you can do some research in. You can also uh, go in and check on incorporation of a Canadian company. And here it is important to tell you that there are two levels of registration of a company. So if you search a company and they are incorporated federally across Canada, you will find them under a federal incorporation. And if they may not be registered federally, they may be registered provincially. So we get a lot of inquiries for European firms who say, I can't find them in the register. Try and search provincially. Um, it's a good tool. It requires research on you, uh, but it's also a good way to find name and addresses on Canadian companies. It is not including the, the 1.2 million um, Canadian SMEs, uh, but it, it will include a lot of companies and it is the most encompassing of the data registries that we know of. On that slide before, you also have a link, which is linked here to what is called the Canadian Importance Database. And this is where you can actually go in and find Canadian companies that are currently importing. And this could be important if you have a product that you know you're just looking for someone who wants to buy it and put it in their store. Um, if we take an example, as we did in this slide here, we search on cheese. And you can search by product or you can search by harmonized system codes. So that's the SSHS code in this case, 040610, and we will get a listing uh, of different kinds of cheese. We pick one, and then we ask for the value of imports into Canada. If you look on the right-hand side, you will actually see the name of the importer. You can search by province, or you can search by Canada-wide. You cannot click on the importer and get their name and addresses, but you have the name of the importer, you have the province that they're located in, and you have their postal code. So that way you can find them in your database search or in a Google search. Very uh, useful tools for a lot of companies who are looking for entry into the retail market in Canada. If you are uh, looking at, okay, so I want to connect with somebody from my country, or somebody who already knows products from my country. You can use the same database, but you can search for country of origin. And the example we have made here is Latvia. Uh, so we have said, okay, I'm from Latvia, and we, I wanna know who are importing products from Latvia. We can see from this slide that $49.3 uh, million was imported from Latvia to Canada. And if you go, uh, if you, you look further down, you can see what provinces uh, those goods were imported into, and again, what companies. So you may not have to go through a lot of logistics and the supply chain because the importer is likely uh, already importing from your country or know uh, the process to do that because your colleagues might be taking care of the supply chain. So this is a very efficient way for people to establish first contact too. Parts of the allure of European products in Canada is tied to immigration too. So you will have focus on some products 
in in provinces and territories where there's a larger uh, immigration of a certain origin. Um, and we tried two examples here. We, we give you one for the west coast of Canada, so in BC. Uh, this is a company over import and export who who acts as an importer. They also act as a distributor, so they sell to others. They act as a full service sales and marketing company, so they may also uh, repackage or co-package or contract package your goods, which some um, exporters from the EU might be interested in. And we'll touch on it a little bit later why why that might be a very important opportunity in Canada. On the on the uh, east coast of Canada, we actually have a, a gentleman who used to live in the UK who established a, a market um, in Canada for Pete's Fritique, which is European goods a little broader than just foods. You will see a picture of it here. Uh, they have a winery, they have a restaurant, um, and they have recently been uh, acquired by Sobeys, which is a Canadian national grocery chain. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, also already um, very familiar with European goods, and we have seen a lot of companies increase their sales to the peaks uh, after CETA came into force, but also since the takeover from Sobeys. So we talked a little bit about having other people import your goods. If you were in the position of wanting to import uh, yourself, setting up a branch to import, or if you want to know the process, the phytosanitary requirements, um, the, the landing part, if you want to know that process yourself, we have linked that on the slides as well. So, so you can get a feel for that. A lot of people that we have seen successfully enter the Canadian market have been participating in trade shows, whether it is uh, some of the major trade shows in Canada that we have listed here, um, or it is trade shows within the EU where Canadian companies have been present. Uh, this is an example, and you will find a link in the bottom. Uh, where you can find other trade shows. So we've just listed some of them here. And this is important because Canadian, larger Canadian firms will exhibit at these, not necessarily just to sell the goods or services, but also to find new distributors. And Sobeys is an example of this. We have seen a lot of companies make contact with Sobeys this way. They actually have a global sourcing unit that participate at trade shows like CL just to find companies like, like some of you that are on the call today. Sobeys is one of two national uh, Canadian grocery retail chains, 1,500 stores. So uh, that's a fair bit across Canada. And they operate um, drug stores, uh, a little bit like pharmacies and uh, retail fuel locations as well. So a popular choice for many exporters into Canada. And when we talk about companies like this, SOPIs or, or other national um, retail chains, we want to talk to you about the Canadian private label market because it is unique and it's probably unique because these two family owned uh, grocery chains or retail chains as they started were family owned businesses gained a lot of confidence for Canadian consumers. The private label in this retail chain is more than 2,500 um, different goods that are sold under the, under the brand name Complements. And Complements, um, as a private label does not should not discourage you from moving in with your own brand. You can certainly sell your own brand to to these stores and, and importers as well, but giving you an idea of the private label market in Canada. Uh, you can see on this slide how different that is from many markets where brands will be the drivers. 
we are not um, in any way discouraging you from moving in with a brand. We're just saying, take into account how many people in Canada are actually trusting their stores for a private label. Um, it could also mean that you don't have to do as much of the marketing uh, piece or the branding piece because your partner in Canada might take that on for you. So having talked about the immigration part, making networks there, having talked a little bit about the online resources, you connecting directly um, to an importer or to an organization that is importing and selling and distributing. We also want to talk to you about uh, uh, Enterprise Canada Network, which is very unique uh, and special in its resources because it works both ways. It works for uh, Canadian SMEs and it works for European SMEs. So it works for European SMEs to identify uh, Canadian partners and ventures, and they actually now have a another new entry point um, in Canada, we encourage you to, uh, to contact them and they will then reach out in this huge network uh, of over 600 business support organizations to see if they can make a link for you. Um, unique unique uh, initiative that uh, where we haven't seen it in force for that long, but again, post CETA, which has really ignited trade, I'm sure this would be one of the most trusted resource, resources going forward. The Canadian Trade Commissioner Service is sort of the Canadian part of this. It is representation of Canadian trade commissioners across uh, the world in over 160 cities. They also have presence in each of the EU member countries. So the Canadian Trade Commissioner will help Canadian companies identify a partner. We'll show you some success stories in the end, but that also means that if they are familiar with you in your organization, they will easier be able to make um, a referral to you. So we have put an example on here in the bottom uh, for Poland. It just, if you click on it, it will give you all the contact for the Canadian Trade Commissioner. It will give you uh, the market report, so what companies in Canada will read about you and, and your country and your sectors. So that's a good way of knowing the perception that your Canadian partner will have going into your conversation. You are then able to go to the next step too. And uh, under CETA, again, as, as the most comprehensive trade agreement ever, procurement is included. And this means that you have access uh, to procurement opportunities in Canada uh, if it falls within certain uh, qualifications. So the EU has published a great procurement guide. And again, uh, if you lost that part, uh, the, the CETA trade agreement being the most comprehensive trade agreement ever and procurement is included in that. You can download the guide here, or you can ask uh, to have a copy sent to you. If you want to do that, we'll provide that. I want to share with you a little bit about procurement in Canada, so you understand what levels that there are. Uh, but great guide, I fully recommend you downloading it. When you are looking at procurement in Canada, that's covered under the agreement, um, it's not every opportunity, there might be some separate agreements and the guide will tell you this, but it is important to understand that in Canada we have procurement on the federal level, uh, we have procurement on the provincial level, and we have procurement at the municipal level. The most comprehensive um, procurement that we have is found on Merck's, uh, and that's the first link here. It is fee-based, I think it's around $250 uh, for a yearly subscription, or you can pay $50 per $47, $27 for some tenders to download them um, and to participate. A lot of the uh, partnering that we have seen has been a tender that's been post. The European firm has gone in and see who the Canadian bidders are 
and then they have contacted the bidders to partner. We have also put a link in here to all the provincial chapters uh, of procurement opportunities. So you may have a provincial interest or you may just go on and look at the federal opportunities. We also want to share with you somebody who was successful doing this, um, an architect firm, a European architect firm, Smith Hammer Lesson, partnered with CBCL, which is an engineering and SME engineering company in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and built this beautiful library. Um, was actually named one of the top 10 new buildings to see. So they were contacting uh, the bidder on this project. So it's entirely possible to find partners this way, not necessarily bidding it yourself, but finding a partner to bid it with. When we talked about all of this, we're almost at the stage where, where the, the option left here is that you start your own company in Canada. And some will do foreign direct investment uh, as an opportunity to, to do trade in Canada. And if you are doing that, we have made a listing for you here of all the provincial uh, trade and investment bureaus that could assist you in that. So they each have a mandate to attract companies. So if you are looking to do that, that would be a good place to start. There's also a federal link here to invest in Canada. Uh, if you wanna use that to identify maybe where you should start. It is a good tool. There are very uh, competent people out in the different agencies and they are very well aware of Canadian partner opportunities too. So they may refer you that is within the mandate as well. So you're there, you found a Canadian partner, you want to go see them. Uh, under CETA, again, under the labor, labor mobility requirements, you have a great opportunity uh, to travel, whether you are a business person, you are attending a trade show, you are a service installation person. Uh, but before you get to actually enter Canada, you need to be authorized to get into Canada. And as a citizen of the EU right now, uh, you are um, visa accept. And the reason I say right now is that the world changes a lot. But right now, and it is, has been um, for, for a while now, you have to go online and fill out an electronic travel um, authorization, what's called an ETA. It costs you $7. You can do it online and please do it before you go. Don't do it in the airport. It will be too stressful. While it has been successful for some, um, it is uh, recommended that you do it beforehand. You are now there. Uh, you, we've shared with you a lot of hopefully uh, very helpful resources. And now we want to give you three examples of things that did happen and uh, leave you with a slide on uh, the, the cooperation that's already ongoing between the EU and Canada. Uh, the first example we want to share with you here is the Hart Shoe Company, which is a company located in the east coast of Canada who unfortunately had to close uh, because it wasn't lucrative for them to manufacture anymore in the Brunswick and they didn't have in the new generations all the know-how. So what happened was with CETA into force and the reduced tariffs, uh, this company actually started looking into who are known for good quality in, in shoes, who's a good manufacturer, who has knowledge, and they found a company in Spain. They partnered uh, eventually after negotiations, and that enabled the Canadian company to manufacture in Spain and now sell all over the world from New Brunswick in Canada. We also have uh, a Canadian company who were contacted by a Danish engineer this, Danish, uh, this Canadian company did blood samples for marine mammals. Uh, and this Danish engineer had Googled it and said, this is, uh, this is quite interesting. Um, I wonder if that could be done with human samples, blood samples. Th he reads out to the company. The company uh, had a German 
uh, with them, Dr. Brown, who actually moved to Canada as a child. So again, emphasizing this part about the the connections you can make on on uh, the immigration patterns. Uh, he thought it was an interesting inquiry. They actually partnered, and Motrix today is exporting with uh, with the help of of this company uh, to Denmark, Sweden, Germany, the UK, and the US. The last uh, structure story that we want to share with you is um, a European energy company, Erstel, that won that want a contract to be a supplier to the US offshore market. So part of that was going through Canada, using Canada as a supply chain. And they made, they had made the commitment to go do this in April of 2020. And we all know what happened. Uh, recently in the world. And despite of, of, of that, despite of COVID, uh, the, the engineers from, from Earth were actually able to go to Halifax, meet the vessel that brought in their parts uh, and fulfill their US contracts. So we want to leave you with this very positive notes on the success stories that things are possible today and hopefully we will see many of you in Canada. The last part we want to share with you is a little bit on the um, ongoing Canadian and, and European collaboration, because it is not new. It is not new for, for Canada and for, for uh, uh, European countries to work together. And EU can is, is probably one of the best examples for that very strong advocate for Canada EU trade, uh, very effective and has a great business network in Canada. If you are not familiar with them, uh, you should get to know them and you should also know that all the honorary councils uh, that are members of this are very helpful in outreach efforts as well. Uh, the EU uh, Chamber of Commerce, as I mentioned before, excellent entry point. Again, it depends on where you are with your business. Uh, where what are you selling a product or service? Where do you think your your entry is? Um, Eureka being a research or being a um, intergovernmental supported organization has a lot of emphasis on European uh, companies finding partners to commercialize something, whether it's uh, at home or abroad. And we've actually seen just recently uh, partnerships between Canada, Budapest, and Denmark in this. And the last part, I'm rushing it now because I want to leave time for questions, uh, is I want to share with you to go on this link, uh, the European Cluster Col Collaboration Platform, and look at all the success there's been in doing matchmaking between uh, EU firms and Canadian companies. So this is what we had for you today. Uh, I will start the, or Matol will start the QA session. Uh, yes, so hi everyone again. Uh, Pernil, could you just shift to the next slide? I think. Uh, so we can, we can take your um, questions now. You can just enter them into the question box and uh, Pernil will receive them. It will only go to uh, the host of this, the webinar. Um, and then it will be forwarded to me. So if you think you may have competitors or anything else on the, on the thing, you, you don't necessarily have to, to share it with everybody. In procurement, are all call for bits available in both languages? Thank you for that question. Very good question. Uh, they are available in both languages if they're issued by the federal government of Canada. Otherwise, they could be in one or the other. How many SMEs do we have in Canada? SMEs makes out for roughly 96, 97% of Canadian businesses. Uh, medium sized businesses makes up about 2% and large companies uh, about 0.5%. So there's a huge opportunity for you to find SMEs or like-minded companies out there, while we often hear about some of our larger firms, um, there are a lot of SMEs out there that would be interested in partnering. 
Could you please talk a bit more about the cultural differences between Europeans and Canadians in the business context? Yes, it's a good question. So one of the things that I found uh, heard coming from Denmark, which is a very egalitarian um, country compared to Canada, was I immediately moved into first name with people and, and you don't do that in Canada. Um, I found it hard because I would start by saying, hello, my name is Pernilla. Um, I'm calling from uh, Kisob International. And people didn't want the long introduction. They just wanted to know who I was calling for. And then the introduction would come once I read that person. Um, on a more, on a more non-personal level, uh, and speaking to the Canadian political correctness, it is a, it's a very civil dialogue in Canada. Um, and, and that probably becomes about because of of the political correctness. There's a huge respect for people in um, one of the, the new initiatives that's being tested and we talked about is doing blind hiring practices. So you won't be able to see people's uh, age or sex or uh, ethnic orientation. So trying to give equal opportunities to all. Um, to me, again, as I said to start with, the colloquial English ones, understanding all the references Canadians have to, to culture. Um, I was surprised there wasn't a question on hockey on the Canadian, Canadian citizenship test, because uh, I studied a lot about hockey before, uh, before I applied. But uh, the, the pride of, of uh, Canadian hockey, of, of the wilderness and, and all of this is, is a good conversation, a good starter for conversation. In culture. Are all Canadian companies required to register and what is the difference between registering federally or provincially? They're not required, that's a good question, they're not required to answer, uh, to register for both. They register for one or the other. Um, and starting a, a business in Canada takes about a thousand dollars and a lawyer. Uh, where in some of, of the European countries, there's a bigger, larger capital requirement for starting a firm. Um, it also means that a lot of companies in Canada uh, will ask for credit applications if you're dealing with them, because there's not the capital requirement, which means they're asking for who are your last three clients, did you pay them on time, etc. So again, the cultural differences to some, to some countries. What information can you give us about the actual situation of the retail sector in Canada? Uh, the, I, I'm not, sh thank you for the question. I'm not sure what you mean by the actual situation of the retail sector in Canada. Uh, if you mean post uh, COVID, the, the retail sector is opening up again in Canada. Uh, our office uh, in Nova Scotia will actually start being back in the in the office. Our staff will start being back in the office on the 15th. So so Canada is uh, slowly starting up, like many other countries, and the retail sector in general is uh, vibrant. I would say, if you go back and look at the presentation I made on the on the private label, the retail sector in every aspect of it being um, being uh, apparel, or if it's uh, foods, or if it's home decor, very much again, um, private label is a leader in the retail sector. So that's important for you to know. We are an FMCG company. We sell biscuits. Do you recommend more than one distributor as the country is huge? Good question. Uh, yes, the country is, is huge. So my first question, of course, that it would depend on your production capacity. That would be number one. Uh, and if your production capacity is such that you could provide um, biscuits to more than one province and territory, absolutely. Uh, you will find a lot of distributors are 
uh, provincial, so that means they distribute within their province or one or two provinces. Uh, the example that we had on the two uh, importers, these uh, are provincial based, whereas Sobeys and their global sourcing is across Canada. But supermarkets and retail um, and particular foods across Canada is also tailored to the residents of that province and territory. So if you have more resident of a certain origin, that might be special supermarkets like the one we showed you from Pete's, which is a European based uh, retail chain. I would definitely look at three or four and then I would shortlist them if I were you, depending on your capacity um, and where you particularly want to be in Canada. Which trade finance tools are the most commonly used by importers and exporters in Canada? Which trade finance tool? Uh, good question. The, the way that the Canadian government is structured on the, the tools that they offer, I'm not talking about banks or, or private sector now, uh, but they are still uh, mainly funding exporters. So that means exporting from Canada. Import, um, while it is a very important part of production, is still not at the same level of financial support or instruments as, uh, as exporters will receive. However, um, Export Development Canada and some of the, the tools that are available to exporters will include uh, receivable insurance, um, accounts receivable insurance, uh, some of them will even include extending the line of credit to the buyer to buy Canadian goods. And when I say Canadian goods, that could be Canadian European goods if you're if you if you find a partner to, to manufacture with. From what I see in about the other um, 90 countries that we deal in, the, the, the financing for Canadian firms or Canadian firms and their partners is is very solid if if you want uh, or have, have the the time uh we can also send it out google um uh, export development canada it's export development edc.ca don't make it edc.dk uh, that's a real estate chain in denmark but uh, there you will be able to see the the uh the all the specifics for export in canada can you expand a bit on distribution channels how easy they are to penetrate and if it varies according to sector yes it varies because some will again have distribution across the country some will have in regions and some will have in one province only so huge huge difference uh if you look at the Canadian importers database, you might see a company that has an office in Ontario, but they still may be supplying BC or British Columbia or the East Coast. You will have to actually look up the company to see where they distribute. Um, how, uh, how easy is it to, to gain entry into the distribution channel? Um, in, my, my, my first answer will be, it's not hard if your product and your price is right, um, because that's what they do. Uh, they, they sit in the supply chain and look for products that they can sell uh, in the Canadian market. So I don't think it's hard to do if, you're, if your product and your price is right and that, that it fulfills all the phytosanitary requirements. Um, for we, we have connected a little bit here, maybe some of the, the people who are online and do trade and services. Um, lots of opportunity for you too. And, and while you don't have the same sort of uh, phytosanitary or logistical regulations, are you container loads or not? And does it have to be cold storage? Uh, there is a real keen interest in Canada to partner. I felt welcome in Canada. Uh, the 40% of, of my staff felt welcome in Canada. And our networks has benefited uh, companies. And we partner internationally because if we are doing something in, in Poland or in Portugal, we want to work with a local expert. And that's how a lot of Canadians look at things. So I'm encouraging the service sector here too 
to to become part of uh, of your if you're managing consultants or or subject matter experts uh, absolutely uh, give it a try too you know, a few more questions here there's another one asking this is agri foods is there something like the fda in canada the eu has uh, on its help desk and have the size of the label everything that you have to hear by and uh, canada does as well so we'll send you a link to that that's that's an easy one to fulfill what about metal industry process lines for food, fish, meat industries? Does Canada import such process lines or do they prefer to make it locally? Could it be interesting to have an outsourcing company in Europe? We have seen, uh, again, Canadian companies import um, machinery from the EU, but we have also seen a number of Canadian companies do foreign direct investment outwards. So have processing plants in uh, Europe. A lot of them are in um, Eastern European countries. And, and if you are looking up uh, potential partners, uh, you remember that the Canadian companies are as eager as you are to take advantage of CETA. And, and this webinar is about partnering, right? So there are two parties to making a successful, um, a successful deal. So, so absolutely for Canadian companies, and we've seen it a lot on the processing side and on the food and seafood side, I'm sure that there would be opportunities. Um, we can try, and if you, you have, we have your email there, I think, uh, we'll send you a link to a couple of companies that you can research that have done that. And, and uh, the global value chain, again, one thing is that you can, you can this is about CETA and the CETA agreement. There's also a, a huge market outside of Canada um, in the global supply chain. There's a CUFMA, which is the new NAFTA agreement uh, that with a Canadian partner, you could also have access to. Well, okay, there's one question here um, in, relating to the current situation. Do you perhaps have any information whether trade shows or events will be held later this year in Canada? That's a hard question to answer. Uh, do I have information if they're going to be helped? No, uh, I don't. But if you go to the link, uh, I should be able to find the slide number here. When you get the presentation, um, it is slide number 26. If you go to that link in the bottom of the page, you can, you can type in the trade show that you are thinking of, um, and then you will be able to see their communication about if it's going on or not. Obviously, some of the ones that are uh, like PDAC that will now be in March next year, um, there may not be communication yet. But as I said before, Canada is opening up um, slowly but surely. One of the indications, again, of the importance of, of immigrants to Canada is that our Prime Minister um, actually uh, made a federal announcement that uh, that not just Canadian citizens and Canadian residents, but Canadian immigrants uh, could gain access to Canada too if they fulfill all the requirements. And that was only this week. Um, trade shows, hard to say. Uh, if if you have a particular one in mind and you can't find it under the, the link here, send us an email and uh, we'll try and find out for you. We are a delicatessen premium food trade company from Europe and would like to know how do the Canadian, how does the Canadian market feel about the Mediterranean food philosophy? So I, I guess this would be um, European food. What's the taste for European food? This is specifically for the food industry. Yeah, um, as, as I hope uh, the, the, the two previous uh, importers showed, there's a huge appetite uh, for European uh, delicacy, for Mediterranean uh, delicacy and, and kitchen. And again, the, the majority uh, of, of people who are, who are making purchasing decisions in Canada, as you can see from the influx, a lot of those are going to be immigrants. Uh, they're going to try different dishes from different countries. And when we have a national chain, that has acquired a particular European delicatessen importer uh, that indicates to all of us that it certainly is a huge potential market for you. 
everyone, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, for I mean, There's still a lot of unanswered questions, but we will follow up with you by email. This uh, presentation will be available in the coming weeks uh, after it's re finished recorded, and we can send you the slides from the presentation and any other information. So thank you for joining us today, and thank you very much, Pernil, for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone.